everybody. Welcome back to another uh, episode here. Today I have Patrick Estefanidis. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm sure I mispronounced the last name there. Uh, Patrick is um, a co-owner of Timeless Tapes. So Patrick, welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate you inviting me and excited uh, to chat with you. Yeah, so you, you definitely have a unique uh, business there where you're memorializing basically uh, people or translating the old technology into new technology or, or, or the contents of the old technology into the new technology. Uh, so maybe tell us a little bit of like what are you doing today with that business? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you correctly said, I am a co-founder actually with my wife with a company called Timeless Tapes. We're based out of here in the Tampa Bay area. And what we say that we do is we help families with preserving their legacies by converting old aging media like videotapes and photos into digital. So um, it's been such a reward. We're about to hit our one year mark actually on the first of next month. Um, but we've been able to help many families with again, preserving their legacies and just seeing their reactions is so great. Um, I think it's that perfect blend of having uh, work that you love to do um, because of the fact of how fulfilling it is for the customer. You know, it gives you that sense of purpose and meaningfulness. So that's uh, kind of in a nutshell what we've been doing right now. Okay. And um, I looked you up a little bit on LinkedIn. So kind of like your, your career history and so on. You were in the Air Force before and you went through schooling. And, and just before the call, uh, you mentioned that you're still in school for another master's degree. Um, if we could go back to high school middle school who were you like back then yeah uh, very very different than what i i was today i guess maybe the one thing that stuck was kind of being ambitious but um in uh high school i was not a very good student <laughs> uh paying attention to uh you know assignments <clears throat> excuse me and teachers and stuff wasn't really my strongest uh um, point about me and i kind of just wanted to do things that i wanted to do um, but again, school isn't really organized in that way. It's like, these are the lessons you're going to get taught with the exception of like electives, right? And that's what you're going to learn. And I felt that it was difficult for me as being a high school student, like maybe there's not a place for me so much in the world because if I can't get through this type of establishment and pass with good grades, maybe there isn't a place for me in the world. But it, it turned out once I got out of high school, once you go to college, you're making your own decisions, your own majors and stuff, when you're picking your own classes, you naturally have an interest and therefore you tend to excel once that interest is there. So I actually found out years later, um, after getting my associates, actually it was a music production because I was a musician back then, um, but then later getting my bachelor's in IT while I was in the Air Force. I actually just finished one master's now in entrepreneurship with the University of Tampa. Love that school. Uh, go Spartans. And uh, now I'm actually working on my second master's right now with the executive MBA. So uh, I think that's a great question because I feel like some people feel like they might doubt themselves based on how they perform in a certain type of system. But really, when you go through that moment of self-identity, you actually see where you can excel and what your interests are, and you can naturally grow from there. Mm -hmm. So back then, let's say in high school, how would you describe yourself? Were you very outgoing? Were you just kind of, uh, you know, kept to yourself within uh, a limited number of friends? Like, wh wh who were you like in high school? Yeah, yeah, that's that's another good question. So I would say I wasn't one of the popular kids. I was a part of the outcast, so to say. Um, I was still kind of outgoing where I was the talkative one and like to... Um, you know, try to foster different types of connections and groups. So like, for example, in high school, like if we were going to have a party or do something, I was usually the one trying to lead it. Um, but still, again, we were our own very simple niche because I wasn't an athlete. I, I didn't really do too much with that. I didn't really hang out with those cliques and groups and such. Um, but yeah, and I was more, again, focused on music than I was in academics at the time. Did your school have like drama or anything like that, like theater? They they did. Um, so I actually was, of course, uh, being a musician at the time, uh, doing a lot of the uh, courses relative to like doing band and stuff. But they also did have theater as well. Um, however, I worked as I can't remember the name of it, but worked backstage essentially, which was kind of nice to see kind of the operations that happens behind the curtain, so to say, uh, and seeing all the logistics and the production that went into it as well. So you were part of the crew. Yeah, I think it's called um, my son is doing theater right now. So some kind of like, I mean, I'm not a theater person, so I'm not, <laughs> not too, too well versed in it. But um, but I know everybody's kind of different. Like I, I, I grew up in high school. I played sports and so on. 
Uh, but my son is kind of like opposite of that. He doesn't really like sports, but he likes theater and, and, and more creative things like that. So it's interesting. How did you get into uh, music, like liking music and what kind of music were you were you involved with? Yeah, um, so I started music. My first instrument was piano. Um, I actually did it just because of a story my mom told me. So I'm a first generation uh, American citizen. My parents are from different countries. Uh, my mom is from Colombia. My dad is from Greece. But my mom told me after some events that happened in her family, they, were, they had some financial struggles. And she was telling me as a kid, she always wanted to learn how to play piano, but they never had the opportunity to. So when it came about, I just said, hey, I want to learn it. And I actually hated it at the time because the songs they were teaching me is like, you know, simple, generic, happy birthday, like kind of boilerplate songs. But once I started listening to, I think the first like album that really like spoke to me was like Linkin Park. Um, I think it was Meteora or the one after that, that album where you hear this piano line like, man, that sounds awesome. So again, back to like when you find something that interests you you naturally have this inclination to want to learn how something works and operates. So um, from there, it went from wanting to do something to like please or honor my mom, I guess, in a way, and to like, no, naturally, I now want to be able to do this myself. And that led to me learning how to play guitar, which then led to me uh, learning how to do music production, where I got my degree again in college for music production, where I was recording musicians, rather me so performing. Um, and that was a great experience in itself as well. So it, it wasn't like your parents forced you to learn piano. You actually wanted to learn on your own. Yeah, yeah, no. In, in fact, uh, I would say um, my dad really pushed on us the importance of wanting to learn, uh, wanting us to learn business. And I just wasn't ready for it. They're both entrepreneurs. They, they're, they're also co-founders of a business as well. So for, for me, I just, it wasn't resonating with me at the time. I was like, nah, this music thing's going to work out. Trust me. I know the chances, but I'm going to make it, you know? So it wasn't until later on, I was like, oh, actually, I, I do like business. I, there's some sort of creativity and elements that are parallel to what you would see in music as well. There's definitely creativity that's involved in it. Yeah. Right? Um, so in, in high school, when you were kind of uh, your junior, senior year, um, who who was kind of advising you as far as what you should do with your life or how, how you figure out what you should do with your life, where you should go, whether it should be college, workforce, or, or military like you went in? Like who, yeah. who was giving you advice and how did you come to the conclusion that you should go into Air Force? Yeah, that that's a good question. I would say that I kind of more so listen to myself like my parents are always there to support me um as parents always do right um and again there was this push of like you need to go to college and i and i wanted to but again the the, the majors and the topics more on business i wasn't with that so like well at least you you want to go to college and you can go to college for music then then let's do that but where that transition happened from me going from the music industry into the air force was um, I had was wrapping up my degree in music production and I wanted to get my feet in the water like okay let's actually try this so I moved to Brooklyn New York and I interned um, at a studio over there for a year and uh, I quickly realized in, in order to get successful it, it takes a lot of work it can happen but it takes a lot of work and at the time it just wasn't what I wanted in order to get what I was hoping for. So that's where I decided to come back to the Tampa Bay area, kind of regroup. I spent about a year just working uh, while trying to figure myself out. And I was working at a gym and I remember uh, one of our gym members, he mentioned how he was in the army and he told me about all the benefits and what they did. Um, and after speaking to a few other people who were veterans as well, they mentioned like, you, you know, all the branches are good, but maybe consider Air Force. And I walked in and you know, spoke to them, and then that whole process took another year. But I think that was probably one of the most defining uh, decisions, and one of the best decisions that I made was joining the Air Force because it really gave me a lot of structure <clears throat> in how to take ambition and how to apply discipline with it. Mm -hmm. So you uh, was it a, you had like a gap year, or or um, you went right after senior senior grade? Oh no no no! It was it was probably. I so I, I was 18 obviously when I graduated. I didn't join the Air Force until I was about 24. So oh, okay, that, so it was a few yeah, years later. Yeah, a few years later. So we had again the my music production degree and then me interning and then a year of kind of like trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, 
before I ended up going into the Air Force. So yeah, there was, there was some time in between those two major events. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry, I missed that part. Um, so you went into college first for music? Yes, yes, that's okay. correct. What was that experience like? Uh, it, it was it was good. I learned a lot in terms of like being able to know how to talk to people, especially with music, something that is just so kind of like, how do I say this? Like when you make a product, like you know all the components that go into it and nothing changes. The manufacturing doesn't change, right? Mm -hmm. But with music production, you might have processes in place, but every song is a little bit different. Every song has a different type of vibe or feeling. And you have to speak and consult with a musician to make sure that the song that you're working on translate to the way that they have it in their mind, while also making sure that it's going to work for their audience as well. So it's it was really great because it allowed me to really understand communication, right? What is it this person really wants? And then how can we do this efficiently? Because the one thing about music production, especially is if you are the one doing the production, you're mixing, editing and stuff, is you can spend hours working on something. But in business, that's not necessarily the best because the more time you spend on trying to develop something, the more expensive that thing becomes, right? So trying to learn those processes of how do you get better and then of course networking as well that's another big thing is like you want to have better clients that you work with then how do you get yourself into those groups and into those circles to get those types of gigs which is again part of the reason why going to new york that was a great experience as well but you know trying to see how you can get into those different groups and gain those types of clients mm -hmm. so so uh, while you were in college for music after that, did you work in uh, any kind of studio or anything like that? I, I did. It was it was all internships. It was never a, okay. a full fledged employment. So while going to college, any additional time that I had that wasn't me working, a, you know, just a part time job just to get cash, I would try to find opportunities to either um, do internships in different studios around here in the Tampa Bay area, um, working with a, a wide variety of music as well, everything from. Uh, rock, metal, hip hop, jazz, country, just anything I can get my hands on to get some experience and diversity as well. Um, and uh, forgive me, repeat the question one more time. I, I started and I kind of yeah, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> uh, so as far as uh, you met, you mentioned internships, um, mm -hmm. like as far as actual work experience, um, yeah. what did you do and uh, what was that experience like? Like what did you notice about the industry or about that type of work? Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you, I appreciate that. So again, working with all those different types of musicians was great. However, trying to translate that into a job was very difficult um, just because it's it's can be very difficult to get clients that pay um, only in the sense, especially when you're working with uh, smaller artists or bands because their budgets aren't really there. So if they don't have a lot of a budget, that means that you have to do a lot of sessions with a lot of clients just to make something fruitful for yourself um, just to be able to cover and pay your own bills. So when you're a, a college student or if you're living with your parents at the time, it's kind of okay. You kind of suck it up and say like, hey, you know what, it's, it's going to be fruitful later. But trying to grow and scale that business so that way it's profitable you, for you is sometimes a bit difficult. So that's where, again, I took that moment of realization of saying, hey, you know what, um, I love this work. I even love the bands that I'm working with, but the money just isn't there where it's going to be necessarily great for me or sometimes even the bands. Now, don't get me wrong. I've worked on a lot of really cool, interesting sessions, um, but that's where I just, I had to make the decision of like, I, I want to be able to try to do something else. And that's where I came back to Florida and, and had that, you know, some, that time to regroup and think about what I wanted to do before making that decision to go into the Air Force afterwards. Yeah, I heard somewhere that uh, even some of these popular singers, whoever's um, kind of editing their their videos or music and so on, they're, I mean, they they're really not making that much doing it. Um, so it's it's kind of like I'm, I'm, I I don't have any clue about the inner works of that industry, but it seems like like uh, kind of amazing in the negative way of, you know, how how little they make basically. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And and I would say technology has changed. I mean, when I started, Instagram was there uh, and, and, of course, Facebook, but um, you didn't have TikTok, right? So I think that the potential could be there uh, for artists, but it's just that strategy of how you get big is different. 
And I would also say, looking back, I know more about business now than I did back then. I didn't even necessarily have strategies in place on how to appropriately market myself or know how to approach um, certain types of clients as well. So I always wonder and think back, if I had the education today back then, how would I have approached this differently? So, I mean, I'm having too much fun with our company right now. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so it, it is an interesting kind of thing to think about. And it is kind of like you said, amazing in, in a shocking way how much work ha and effort has to go in to be able to make a, um, a sizable amount of income that someone can live off of. Yeah. So then you decided to go to Air Force. Um, what um, what was your experience? How long how long were you in at the Air Force? Yep, I was I was in the Air Force for six years. Actually, when okay. I went in, uh, traditionally, what happens is most people know what their job is going to be. Um, I just wanted to get in so bad that I was willing to sign the contract for six years without even knowing what my job would be. So it wasn't mm -hmm. until like two months in, they're like, medic i'm like okay sounds good uh i like people and i think it's 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 nice to have a type of job where you're helping others as well so it it turned out to be a natural i knew nothing about medicine at all so i, I didn't know how it was going to resonate whether if i had the capacity especially being someone who wasn't the best student in high school i didn't know if i was going to be smart enough to be able to um, learn what i needed to to be a medic and yet i made it through, made it happen, you know, again, because of that interest. Uh, what were some stories from Air Force that you can share? Um, let's see, let's see. I mean, I think there's so many, but because there's so many, I'm trying to grip on, trying to have a hard time gripping onto one. Um, I, the I would say probably rather than a story, just some of the most like rewarding experiences that I had was um, I was deployed. I was in Qatar, a relatively safe area, especially compared to you know other places like Afghanistan. Um, but we would have troops that would come back um, from Afghanistan that we would assist and help. So being able to help them was definitely uh, rewarding and it was great to be a part of that, especially when you're on a deployment. You're usually with a close group of people and you, you grow this bond. So uh, some of those uh, people I still you know try to stay connected with and talking with them today to see how they're doing with their lives. Um, and then I also was working in the ER um, until I ended up getting out. And my last year, the ER was 2020. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that was a very, uh, very difficult experience. But again, I, I think one thing I was really happy about uh, was the re resiliency that we kind of had. Like, OK, here's this new thing that's happening. How do you figure it out? What what do you need to do? So us trying to be inventive with ways on like how to communicate with our patients. So we didn't have it at the time, but like having um, a phone outside of the room and another one inside of the room and deploying those really quickly across all of our patient rooms to be able to try to help us to minimize um, the use of a uh, PPI, that protective gear that uh, that we had to wear every time we went in since everyone needed it we were losing our inventory fast. So coming up with just solutions like that uh, was really great to see and be a part of as well. So those are the ones that mainly just come off the top of my head. <laughs> were you still in the Air Force in 2020? Uh, yeah, so I didn't get out until February of 2021. So pretty much my whole last stint was during the COVID time. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Qatar. What other places did you travel in the Air Force? Yeah, um, I was stationed uh, at JBSA uh, Lackland, so which is in San Antonio, Texas, and I pretty much stayed there for the majority of my time. We did some small training, but not anything that was significant. Again, the biggest one was that deployment to Qatar, um, and and that really was the the biggest one. And in terms of my time in uh, at San Antonio, I did work two clinics, as I mentioned previously, the emergency room, but the one before that was family health as well. Um, which was great because in terms of understanding how the healthcare system works, uh, you kind of learn a bit of the nuances and I still find myself using um, some of that knowledge today. So when I'm going to book a pay or excuse me, book an appointment for myself or my wife, or there's an issue with conflicts or anything else, I kind of have a little bit of some knowledge of knowing how to navigate that better to try to get the results that we're hoping to get, you know, I think it's it's sad that a lot of Americans have to struggle with, you know, trying to deal with the healthcare system. So, I, I feel just more blessed to be able to have some more information on how to try to navigate that with a bit of ease. Mm -hmm. 
What uh, What are some um, kind of lessons that you learned from the from Air Force, um, and and maybe kind of some insights that an average person would not get that you got from there? Yeah, I I think the biggest one that I can think of is when you sign that contract, you you're making a commitment, right? The average everyday person, if they don't like their job, if they want to quit, they can. You can't just like in the middle of your contract, I quit, I'm done. Yeah. So you have to continue on with it. So there were times where obviously things were very difficult, where you get that feeling of like, I want to quit, but you can't. And then you have to start of thinking of creative ways of how do you make your situation better? Or how do you make sure that when you get out of the military, because everyone does, whether you do your four years, six years, or 20 years, or 30, there's gonna be a day when you get out of the military. So how do you start to plan for what your life is gonna look like after that? So I just told myself, hey, you know what? Even though times are tough, and yeah, maybe I'd like to be doing something else right now, how else can I be spending my time outside of what my duties were in the military to try to make myself to have a more fruitful um, life after when I get out. And that's where it led to me getting my uh, degree in, in uh, cloud computing and IT. So, uh, yeah. Do you feel like because of that, uh, it, it gave you more perseverance, more kind of grit to, to stick through something? Like in that case, you didn't really have a choice anymore. You had to stick yep. through it, right? Yep. Exactly, exactly right. And I think especially as, as an entrepreneur, you really have to tell yourself like, hey, um, there are times that are going to be very difficult. So the only way out is through and you really have to learn how to persevere and stay committed and get through things. Um, especially when you're an entrepreneur, you also have to keep yourself accountable. Like if you want something to happen, you have to be the one to do it or you have to be the one who's good at delegating it to make sure it gets done. But if you can't manage that or you can't manage yourself to do that, then you'll it'll be a very difficult time for you to be able to achieve what it is that you're trying to achieve. So, again, I do feel that it was a good benefit for me to go through that because you find things deep within yourself um, that you didn't know that you had before. So, I, again, love the opportunity in the military. And even though there, it has its own challenges and stuff, uh, it, it was still a, a net positive benefit. And, and I'm very glad I did it. So when when you went uh, for the IT degree in um, the cloud computing, uh, how did you come to that decision that you wanted to do that versus anything else that you could have chosen? Yeah, um, so <laughs> I that involves me talking a little bit back about music a bit. Everyone in the music industry at the time was using Macs. And I don't know if you know this, but Macs are pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was trying to find inventive ways to be able to um, achieve the same performance that these computers use that everyone else was. So I ended up building my own computers that had were made of Windows parts, but you could run Mac's uh, operating system on there. So me doing this several times and when I came to this point of like, okay, hey, I did music that didn't work and I'm getting out of the military in a few years, like what can I do? What kind of skills do I have? Well, hey, I like computers. What about just IT in general? And that led to me um, getting some certifications and then I ended up going to uh, WGU, Western Governors University, um, and I ended up getting my degree online in cloud computing. And why cloud computing specifically? I love this idea that you could have a computer somewhere else in the world doing some sort of process for you rather than you having to stand up a physical server uh, in a warehouse. So I really love that idea. That was like bleeding edge technology at the time. So um, yeah, that's that's what kind of led to me that path of IT and cloud computing. Mm -hmm. And then after you got out of the Air Force, it seems like you you went into it a little bit. You worked in there a little bit, and and then transitioned out of it. Like what? Why didn't you stick to it? Yeah, no, good question. So yeah, I was fortunate enough where I got an opportunity to actually. Um, they call it a transition program, where companies will offer an opportunity for people getting out of the military to go into another type of job, and they'll give them like a boot camp. So um, even though I had my degree and my certifications, um, I, I found this opportunity specifically with Amazon that has their cloud computing division, AWS, uh, to work with them. I did the whole program. Uh, it was a great opportunity, especially working with other veterans from different uh, branches as well. 
And that in itself was also awesome because you worked with Fortune 500 companies, helping them solve their problems. And it was really cool. And that led to another opportunity, me working with uh, another big company called Accenture, which does consulting. But the, the one thing about it is as much as I um, really enjoyed the experience and I loved the knowledge of what I was learning, I didn't feel like I was getting the same type of gratification as like what I was getting like working with patients, right? Mm -hmm. When you have a patient coming into the ER, they're having what is arguably one of their worst days, right? Whether it's stroke, heart attack, any of these types of things. So when you are providing interventions to help them and you see the gratitude on their face afterwards once everything is settled, it's such a rewarding feeling. And in IT, you you don't really get those same type of uh, appreciation or feedback back. It's like, okay, thank you for fixing my thing, and then that's it. So I just, I wanted something different, and again, I've always been interested in just like, how can I be an entrepreneur? How can I do my own thing? Again, I wanted to be my own boss when I was in music production, have my own set of clients, have my own studio. So, but how, how do I translate this into something else? So that's where I found out here uh, in Tampa Bay that the University of Tampa had a master's for entrepreneurship. So um, I'm, I'm not so, one, so much uh, someone who believes much in fate, but I was just like, this is too much of a coincidence where I can't ignore it. And I, I just have to throw myself into it. So I decided to say, hey, I'm gonna leave the IT world and I'm gonna put my full heart and focus into joining this master's program and seeing what I can learn. And from there, I'll decide what I wanna do. You know, I didn't have a plan of what the business, uh, the, uh, timeless tapes didn't even exist back then when I made this decision. Mm -hmm. So going through entrepreneurship, uh, like official or structured kind of training, what was that like compared to what you could have learned on your own? Like, do you feel like it benefited you and you learned quite a bit? And what were the things that you learned? Yeah, yeah. So I, first of all, I, I love that we live in an age where college might not be necessary for people to be able to make certain types of progress or success in your life. However, I do have to say that there is a benefit by having a structured course by people who've done things before you. And also, again, with the University of Tampa, they just have a wide network of very, very successful individuals as well who are able to give you your guidance. So throughout the years past, I tried doing things like recording bands, even when I was in the military, I still had a love for music. I was like, maybe I can still try to record, but I didn't really have a plan. I didn't know what, you know, uh, you know, determining what your, your customer segments would be or how to market or how to do all these different types of things. So by being able to go into a course that was also a, a cohort styled program, so you went from one class into the next one to the next one, so it happened sequentially rather than you taking multiple classes at the same time, really helped because you started at a foundational level and then build your skills as you went along until you finished the programming. And the end result, like you go in with, I kind of have an idea to when I left, hey, I have a business plan, I have financial projections, I know who my customer demographic is, and I have uh, an idea of how we're going to be approaching them. And um, again, it also helped that we did start at the business at the same time because I was able to take my education and apply it to the business at the same time to really reinforce that education as well. Have you taken, <clears throat> sorry, have you taken any kind of informal training? There's like so many online gurus that are selling all of their coaching and programs and all that kind of stuff. Have you done anything like that? Um, YouTube University, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but never any like uh, paid ones. I, uh, I, I was always a bit skeptical about that kind of stuff just because it's not to say that there isn't value or people can't provide you value um, with those type of boot camps, especially if you want to get started quickly. But for me, I just tried to learn the best I could with just what was available at a low cost. And uh, that's where, again, I just decided, uh, let me let me just try to go to school as a, as a veteran. I was I had access to benefits. So I'm like, instead of trying to do a boot camp, let me just go to the university. It's here in the local area. And um, again, that's that's kind of the the reason as to why I went that approach opposed to doing a boot camp. Mm hmm. I'm just curious, like, what would be the comparison, like, the the pros and cons of going one way or the other, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that that might be difficult to say, but I would just say, like, this is just maybe an opinion or, or how I would think it would go about. When you go through a boot camp, 
boot camps can be designed like you hear about boot camps about people wanting to be realtors so maybe they have very niche type of boot camps for specific industries which that could be great for people like i don't want to learn about all this other stuff i just need to learn about what i need to know about this subject and what can i do um, versus when you go to the university, it is a more holistic type of view. Like regardless of what industry you plan to go into, you're an entrepreneur, there are going to be um, same uh, motifs and elements that are going to be carried over regardless of what type of industry or business that you do. Um, and again, there's also the timeline, right? So you have boot camps. Some of them are designed to be more like quick pace. Here you go. We're going to be spending a whole week and we send you out into the world. And this program was hey, every Tuesday and Thursday night from 6 to 10 p.m., and it's going to be for a year. So it, it is a bit more of a grind. But for me, it turned out to be a benefit because it allowed me the days when I didn't have class to take whatever I learned and apply it to our business to then go back on the following class to talk about how that impacted our business or what we were able to do and maybe ask questions that I normally wouldn't be able to ask if I didn't have a business. Like, hey, I did what you said, but I also noticed this. Ah, well, that's good that you ran into that. Here's what I would suggest for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned that you're going uh, for another master's degree, right? Yep. And what's, uh, what motivates you to want to learn, especially learn under kind of a structured way? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll be honest, part of, part of it is having, again, um, the resources that, that I have available as a veteran, uh, but there's also veterans who, who may not take advantage of that as well. So I think it still comes down to like an individual and when they're ready at the time or their inclination to to want to seek uh, different types of education. But for me, I guess what it is, is I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself in high school. I didn't think I was going to be much of anyone, especially with my grades being as dismal as they were. So having this life where like I have an associates, I have a bachelor's, I have a master's and like, well, I still want to keep learning. Like that desire to want to grow and better myself doesn't stop. So it's like, you know what? I would really like to take this, this, this EMBA, even though it's another business degree, it's different in its own way than the entrepreneurship that I think will still help me grow as an individual. So, um, but even though I'm not taking some, or even though I'm doing something that's more structured, there's other things I've done in the uh, before, like uh, just for my personal self, whether it's vocal lessons or whether it's not now clearly, but going to the gym, finding things that you want to do to also grow outside. Maybe not necessarily in the sense of a boot camp, though. Mm -hmm. Just overall, what motivates you? What drives you? Um, I would say that has changed a lot over my, you know, living on this planet. <laughs> but I think the biggest thing is for family and for fulfillment. Uh, my wife and I, again, we've been building this business. We really see the potential and what it can do. And we're very happy that it can help a lot of people. So what motivates us right now is to be able to say, hey, the American dream is real. You can make a living off of doing something that you want to do and not necessarily work for someone else and feel like you're tied to a job that you may not necessarily have a lot of passion for. And that's the only way to make a living. We, we, we want to try to fight that and say, hey, this is an idea that I have. Let's make it into a business. Let's see how we can have it so that we can help us prosper within our personal lives while at the same time feeling good and fulfilled about it as well. Mm -hmm. And um, what's it like working with your wife within the business? You know, some, yeah. people, some people get along really well. Um, in business kind of environment, some people don't like how, what's it like for you? Yes. I've, I've seen, I've seen both of those situations outside of, of, of our marriage. Um, I think the one thing that really helped us is, is again, my, my parents are immigrants and my wife is also an immigrant as well. She's from Brazil. So, um, when I first met her, her English wasn't the best. She was still learning. She was here learning English. So what happened when we started dating is that we learned how to communicate. Like, okay, I think I understood what she said, but let me ask again and confirm. So naturally being forced to have to listen to each other and how we communicate and understand each other really set up a foundation for us for the rest of our marriage um, to be able to try to understand, listen to each other's um, concerns that we had as well and try to grow from there. But doing that in business is a different thing, right? How do you have a business with your significant other and make sure that the problems that you have um, at work don't carry over into your um, your personal life. 
And I think there are a few tricks to it. I think in the end of the day, making sure that nothing is personal. So when you get into a disagreement, you make sure that you understand that this is just how you feel about this subject, not anything else outside of the scope of that. And additionally, just making sure that you're treating each other with respect, especially with business. Things can get heated. Um, things might not go a certain way or you have different viewpoints. So how do you make sure that you're still communicating while not feeling like you're trying to attack that other person as well and trying to go through those points and sometimes you just need to say hey you know what let's take a break and come back to it and that's worked a lot too uh, another thing is especially when you have a business I know there in LLCs it's called one thing I think they call it operating agreements in corporations they call it bylaws but they're essentially a set of rules of how the business will operate and what different person can and cannot do. So having things written on paper saying, hey, when it comes to a vote, this is how we go about it, then we know that that's it. And there's no gray area for anything else. So it's it takes a little bit of finesse, but you can do it. And I think part of it is also making sure that you have the personality, the patience, willing to listen and to communicate uh, effectively. That's the biggest advice I can give if you're planning on starting a business with your significant other. So kind of in anticipating certain things, talking through, uh, setting expectations ahead of time. Um, have you taken any kind of soft skills uh, classes or any, any um, programs or anything like that? When you say soft skills, you mean like communication? If you could just clarify, I want to make sure I understand you clearly. Yeah, like, like communication, um, uh, personality, like understanding people's personalities, things like that. Uh not outside of my formal education. I, I think, again, as a musician, I got really good at being in front of crowds without getting too nervous. That was just something I naturally developed, just kind of as a, a side effect, so to say, right? Um, working in the military, when you see patients, I've worked with thousands and thousands of patients. So learning how to communicate with the patient and effectively doing that so that way in the net result they feel comfortable but you're able to still do your job and help them helps so i felt like i built a really good skill with communicating in that regard also the air force in general is just big on how do you speak how do you talk how do you present yourself um and then being in that entrepreneurship program you you want to you want to have this business? Well, great, you're going to pitch it. So I can't tell you how many times we've done a 30 second, a one minute, a, a five minute, a 15 minute uh, pitch or presentation on your business. So naturally you learn how to get better and better. And even in this program now, we did a, a course called personal branding where we also had to do a pitch as well and trying to be very cognizant of the words that you're trying to say and the story that you're trying to tell as well. So no specific formal course have I taken, but just naturally from what I've done in life, I think I've just been able to pick up on some of these things. Yeah. And um, I mean, especially what you mentioned about uh, communicating with your wife because of the language potentially barrier, um, you were not just jumping to assumptions of what you think she said, but you were questioning in a normal way. Um, like, you know, is this what you meant? Is this what you're trying to say? There's actually a book called Crucial Conversations that talks about that, where when we hear and see somebody say something, automatically we create a story in our mind and based on that story we have certain feelings that relate to that story and then we act out then we say or or do something based on that story and and usually that's like a negative way of of communicating like if it's a something some topic that uh, where where two people have opposing opinions where there's some kind of high stakes involved and uh, and then there's strong emotions but what what the book talks about is basically questioning your story like before you just kind of just react to that story clarify or question like is that what that person was trying to say and it sounds like you naturally started doing that or, or were doing that back then so it kind of helped definitely helps <laughs> yeah yeah for sure and i think that's important too because I think it's important before you have your opportunity to speak to make sure you really understood what the information was given to you first, right? Or else, or else you're just, I don't want to say spinning your wheels, but you're not just going in a direction that's going to be positive, right? So, hey, when you said this, excuse me, <clears throat> when you said this, is this what you meant? I just want to make sure I have a clear understanding before I respond to make sure that I'm just going in, in, in or following your mindset, right? Just doing those things, it shows that 
you appreciate or respect the person enough to make sure that you want to have their understanding before you deliver a response back. Even if you are on opposing sides, you're at least showing that sign of respect of making sure you understand the full scope of what they're trying to convey. Did, did you find that that's something that you were trained in in the Air Force as well? I'm just thinking of like pilots, let's say, uh, when they communicate with the tower or, or any kind of critical communication where you have to repeat what the other person said yeah. so that way they know that, that you heard them correctly. Yeah. Um, I unfortunately didn't get to spend too much time with with pilots however that is a good analogy so I, I would say that still works however for me I think it more so has to do with patients like patients again like I said before I was a medic I didn't know anything about medicine so when they go to see the doctor and they mention symptoms that they're having they don't know necessarily how to describe it or what's the terminology that we would use and as a medic my responsibility was to go see the patient understand what the problem is and then translate that information to their provider, to their doctor, nurse practitioner, or, or their PA. So I had to make sure that I understood exactly what the patient was saying, translate it into information that then I can give to the doctor that he understand or they understand because, you know, man or woman um, could decide or could understand what was going on with them. So being able to ingest that information, translate it, understand it, ask uh, confirming questions, and then bring it back to them is, it was just such a a crucial part of my role that again I think I just naturally learned how to be able to listen and try to interpret and clarify mm -hmm. so kind of going back to your entrepreneurial degree and time and when you started um, timeless tapes how did that idea come about and how did you turn it into reality yeah yeah so um, when I decided to leave um, the IT world. I was also, again, music's always going to be a passion of mine. So I did have my home studio. In fact, what you see here is the remnants of it, so to say. I got all the soundproofing on the wall. Um, and I was working with different bands. I was trying to find ways of having different services. And one of the services that I had was to be able to convert VHS tapes into digital. But it was like one of those auxiliary services that I had that I wasn't really advertising. It was just sitting on my website. And as, as a you know, local studio that's not advertising, no one was going to see it. So as I started going through the the coursework in my school, I always have conversations with my love uh, with my um, wife. She loves to learn. And she was the one that actually came up with the idea because I was talking about like, how do you find a service that is able to help more people? So like, how can I get from working with bands and just only helping them, how can I have my service so it helps more people? And she's like, well, why don't we focus more on your digitization? That that sounds like it would help more people than just only just focusing on bands. And I was like, that's an excellent idea. But an idea is just an idea. How do you make sure like it actually has a place in the market? So one of the things that we did was we were, at the time I was taking a course about innovation and there's a great book I highly recommend any entrepreneur to read. It's called The Right It. I don't know if you've heard of it, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the concept behind it is that when entrepreneurs start a business, they usually go in the mindset of trying to build something right before actually confirming if the market actually needs it. So that's where they play, have that play. Is it the right it? So we ended up having to um, test whether people actually wanted the service. We knew our competitors were out there, but how can we see if we wanted to provide a local service would be beneficial? And it started simply with friends, family members, and recommendations to other people and referrals. And it showed like, yeah, no, people are willing to pay for this and even a premium if it is a local service as well. And that's when we knew we had something and it took off from there. So that's kind of how Timeless Tapes came to be, Timeless Tapes. Yeah. Um... And uh, when you were starting it, how did you decide that you wanted to be a co-owner or, or involve other people rather than just do it yourself? So um, I would say my wife has been so supportive on so many things. I mean, just being a spouse uh, in the military can be very demanding um, as well, but there's no one else I kind of trust more than, than my wife with a lot of these things. And I feel that I tend to be the person who has a lot of ideas. My head can go into the cloud sometimes and she's sometimes there to help keep me grounded. So often I will ask her like, hey, what do you think about this idea? And she won't necessarily like, no, that's a bad idea. But like, well, how would you do that? 
right? Asking questions like to get me to think about it a little bit more. So because we already had this type of communication uh, with one another, it just felt like a natural fit for us of like, let's try to work on this together. As long as we don't, you know, have a dent in our marriage because of it, let's let's see if we can do this together. And uh, again, now here we are almost a year later and we're, we're still doing it. <laughs> So what what was it like having being in business for one year? What were some ups and downs throughout this year? Yeah, it's it's interesting because I think for us it might be a little bit different than than other entrepreneurs um in the sense of where I was going to school at the same time. I think for when people start businesses, if they don't have that formal education, you're kind of taking your best guesses. For us though, it was great for that one year for me to be able to approach my professors with different types of questions and different types of sub subjects. They also, again, as I mentioned, have a huge network of individuals that you're able to get in connection with. So being able to speak to lawyers and get their advice of like how to start things or things to consider. Like you think our business is as simple as like converting tapes, but like what do you do in a situation when someone sends you a tape with material that shouldn't be on that tape? Or how do you handle like copyright issues and stuff like that? So trying to put a service ag uh, agreement together to make sure that we are protecting ourselves as a business. Because in the end, all we want to do is be able to help people. Uh, and again, for our business, we want to make sure that we're profitable as well. But you got to know how to protect yourself. So our first year as a student really helped us getting established of just like what are the fundamentals we need getting ourselves uh, registered as a business entity, you know, things like that. Some things that people feel that they can do and push on later. So um, it was great. I, I, I honestly loved it. As far as your professors that you were going to for advice, what is their background? Are they, do they have like real world experience in starting and running businesses or are they more of just kind of research? They researched a lot of other entrepreneurs and now they have the, the knowledge, the theory behind it. What was that experience like? Yeah, uh, I would say it was a blend of both, right? So if you're speaking or if you're taking a finance course, you're going to have someone who's worked in finance or has their own business in helping uh, companies with uh, their finances, whether it's being a temporary uh, CFO for them, like quarterly, especially when you're a startup kind of ramping up that scale. You do have some who are more research based, but have made their own accomplishments within their own industries as well, even um, like when you talk about innovation, innovation isn't just limited to entrepreneurs. How do you take innovation to the company you work for to help that company grow, right? Um, and then we had uh, other uh, professors, uh, I can give you their names later, uh, who have started their own businesses and has made a, a stupid amount of wealth, Let, let's put it that way. But hearing how they did it and hearing the culture of their business like not just like hey we're here to do this but how do you get your employees excited how do you get your employees to believe in the passion of what you're doing and how that's instrumental i think a lot of people kind of overlook that like i just have a business i just have empl employees i tell them what to do and that's it but having that culture and and showing the importance of it to help you grow to make your business get to that next level is also great so in short it, it, it's a bit of a hybrid but i think there's been benefits from from having both those types of teachers yeah, uh, I, right. I mean, definitely it's somebody who has experience. You can learn a lot from them. Uh, but they're, if they're not able to, n if they're not good teachers, then it's harder to learn from them, right? Uh, yeah. Or you could have really good teachers that can teach really well, but if they don't have the experience, then they can teach only what they know, but not from actual experience. So it's it's good to have like a blend they, of both. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there is a saying that we learned in one of our courses is the uh, menu is not the meal, right? Mm -hmm. So for those of you, in case, it just essentially means is that you can have a plan until you get started and then suddenly your plan has to pivot, has to change, right? So even though it's great to learn all these different types of things, once you get out there in the real world, you see how there's so many different variables that change that you have to adapt to. Uh, and again, I think that's part of the reason why it was so beneficial for me to start our business during the program, just to have that kind of a cyclical relationship between me being a student, me being a business owner. Um, and again, being able to speak to those professors who did it themselves, who were entrepreneurs, um, really gave you great advice. And then also speaking to professors who are, even though they're more research-based, they can tell you how to do your own research for your business in terms of like what to do with marketing and, and, and such as well. So benefits to both. <laughs>
Yeah. So uh, the, the name of the company of the company being Timeless Tapes, it, it's in some ways it's it's something of the past, right? Yeah. So what do you how do you address or how do you look at your market share and marketplace of um you know is your marketplace going to grow or shrink because like like just just kind of intuitively you think about it and it's like okay it's gonna grow it's not gonna grow but it's gonna shrink over time because people will have less and less or there will be less and less people with tapes with kind of that legacy kind of a thing how like what are your thoughts around that how do you try to address that thinking into the future that that is a a great question one that we often uh, get right and because it's not an evergreen business on on the surface level, right? Because as you digitize more tapes, that's less tapes out there for you to digitize. So right. how do you stay in business? So there's a, co a couple of concepts behind it. People will still say, well, even though there's a business that might not be evergreen, that doesn't mean that you still can't make a profit and be successful. But we don't want to just hold on to that mindset. How do we keep ourselves in business? And as we've seen, as time has gone on, even though the majority of our services that have been purchases, uh, purchased is going to be for VHS tapes, mini DV, 8 millimeter tapes, there's other legacy formats that are out there. So I, I like to make the joke when I walk into a room and when I'm doing a pitch, I say, show me, uh, show me a computer that has a CD player or DVD player. And people forget that CDs and DVDs are now obsolete legacy items. So some people, they don't want to go through the hassle of trying to pull that data off. So we also get orders for pulling uh, aged media off of those other types of digital formats as well. So part of it is just trying to be forward thinking in what new technologies will be falling off and become obsolete and how that can be a business opportunity. But the other side of it as well is how do we expand our services to help them? So one of the things that we're looking to do is to have a uh, essentially like a cloud storage solution. We like to call it the Google Drive and Netflix, but for your family memories. Mm -hmm. So that way families can have a place in the cloud to always revisit those memories. And that could be something that's a subscription service as well. So it's, it's thoughts like that that we're having on how do we keep this business going and keep it aligned uh, for as long as we can. And then as far as your mindset towards your business, are you looking to just go after a niche that you have right now and just stick to what you can do? Or are you looking to potentially grow it into uh, a bigger team, a bigger company? Yeah, no. So definitely the latter is what we want to do. But it, it will take a little bit, again, I used the word earlier, but finesse in the sense of one of the things that makes us different is that we provide our customers with local pickup and drop off. So opposed to families having to package all of their precious memories in a box, send it in the mail, and then hope nothing happens to it, um, we provide that convenience of being able to pick it up for them. So they don't have to worry that about that potentially happening as well. So because we have that type of business model, what we're looking to do is be able to grow and have more, what I say, dominance in the Tampa Bay area in terms of this service. And once the business has matured and we've reached that dominance, uh, dom uh, dominance, we want to see how we can lift and shift that business model to other major metropolitan areas. So we're based out in Florida. So where can we find other areas like Miami or Orlando where we can bring that to as well? So that's certainly uh, the plan is to be able to grow the business so we can expand it to other areas. Have you considered, uh, uh, kind of looking into that future, have you considered whether franchising or whether having a branch uh, kind of a model, like, w have you thought about that? And if so, yep. like, what are you leaning towards? Yep. Um, I would say we haven't made a decision on that yet. What I, because this is a, a conversation I have a lot when I pitch with different investors um, or just other mentors who want to give us feedback, they ask that question. And I leave that door open-ended because I feel as we mature the business, once we get to that point, that's where we can make that decision. Because I've heard people say, franchising is the way to go. And other people say, don't give up that control just do it yourself and bring it over somewhere else so um i guess i would say more to come on that but both options are on the table yeah and um what are some uh, some examples of kind of content that you see out there like is it is it mostly like family memories is it something unique like from world wars you know world war one two or the past or like like what what are some cool stories that you hear or see from that content. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, customer privacy, but at a holistic level, right? I will say that the 
majority of the material that we see are going to be family based content birthdays um, weddings or just random happy moments with families holidays and such uh, and those are very precious and and even something that I learned in my own family is like you get to relive moments not only with your family but with those who might not be with us anymore so being able to see them again in that sense it just ha ah, man gets me going <laughs> but it, it really um, it sparks this emotion in you. So we do see a majority of the content being that, but in addition, we have seen families who've, whether they've owned restaurants and they've had like TV spots and commercials. So being able to digitize that is like, that is so cool because not only um, is it something that is just from the past, but it's so significant and so important, even though it's not a family memory, it's something significant to that family because it's what they've been able to accomplish as well. Uh, yeah. And, I think those are the majority of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you describe the the variety of services that you offer? Yeah. So uh, again, our biggest service that we offer is digitization, and we do it for a wide variety of formats. So you have really two elements that we talk about. You have videos and you have photos. So for videos, we convert everything from VHS tapes to VHSC, which were the smaller versions, uh, eight millimeter and mini DV. Uh, and we are going to be shortly start doing like eight millimeter reels uh, as well. We just got the equipment in for that not too long ago. So we're excited to get started with that. And for photos, we do your standard printed photos like your Kodak four by six. But we also do uh, photo negatives and we also do photo slides, which is super, super cool. I love those technologies. It's like that's the other thing about this business, like things I didn't know about before that I know now, like I didn't know what photo slides were. Someone asked me, can you do this? And I looked, I'm like, yeah, our equipment can. And when I saw how it worked, I'm like, that is so crazy that this technology ever existed. Yeah. What are, what are photo slides? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Forgive me. Forgive me. So uh, assuming you know what a photo negative is, it's that long yes. strip with multiple pictures. So a photo slide is imagine just one of those pictures, but like on this like little square. But instead of it being a negative, it's positive. So it's still in the in the color of what the image was, but it's translucent. So like um, where I've seen it that I never knew I saw it before. Sometimes you see movies in like the 80s where they like hit the like the slide projector and the mm -hmm. slides are in there, have the photos, and they'll, they'll project it onto a screen. Oh, okay. So what we do is we have our equipment that is able to, to take a scan and digitize that, so that way you have a high-resolution image that you're able to, to look at it. Uh, but instead of needing a new projector, obviously now you have it on your phone or your smart device. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, they have, like, uh, wheels or real not reels, but wheels with, like, pictures. It almost makes a... Yeah, I've seen it's like a it's like a carousel type of design, the right. projector itself. But the slides come out individually and stuff, and it's pretty neat how they like stored them and safe keep them as well. Um, but yeah, really, I think that's one of my favorite photo technologies that I learned about while while doing this. What about microfilm, like in the libraries where they would uh, store news articles and things like that into these tiny films that you, that you put under some kind of projector and and see? Have you kind of come across anything like that? Not as of yet, just because most of our business is business to consumer, right? So when we start looking to things like news articles or old books that maybe people want to have digitized, that's where you start to go B to B or really more like business to government or organization. We would love to see how we can expand into those different types of uh, customer segments as well, because that's that's a part of a different type of history. Instead of being someone's family, now you're talking about you know the history of a nation or of a local area. So I, I would love to to start getting into into those areas as well. Yeah, and for now you're saying you cover kind of Tampa Bay area. What if somebody across the U.S. wanted to do this? Are they able to reach out to you, send the tapes or anything like that? Or what, what do you recommend? Yes. So we highly recommend that you reach out to us. We are working on putting together our processes of how to be able to service clients that are outside of our geographical service location. Um, but we don't want to turn anyone away. Um, I think, again, one of the things that makes us very different, we're, we take a lot of pride in all of the work and care that we do into preserving uh, media. And you, you'll see that by our Google reviews as well. And we've naturally had people who've mentioned interest about sending their items to us. So um, if you want to go ahead and reach out, our website is timeless-tapes.com. At the very bottom of the homepage, you'll see an area where you can fill out for an inquiry. Just, you know, when we have that discussion, mention where you are and we'll try to see what we can do with the logistics. But we are hoping at a uh, 
time in the very near future, we can set up a process of when people do want to send stuff to us, we can. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe I looked up your website. Um, let me take a quick look right now, like <laughs> <laughs> live. Okay, timeless dash. I was just curious. So, so there's there's a couple, couple, um, uh, not ideas, but methods or or uh, perspectives on business. Some people want to keep business uh, just kind of vanilla in the sense that there's no person behind it, or at least in the marketing or on the website, uh, like you don't see the people who are working in that business kind of a thing. And other people bring their personality their, themselves into it. What is, I mean, it looks like your, I don't know what your mindset is towards that, but, but from the website, you're keeping your face, your name, as far as I, I couldn't find like any kind of about section, like who started it, who owns it, that kind of thing. Like what's your mindset in doing it that way versus the other way? Yeah, uh, I would say uh, budget, <laughs> honestly. No, uh, because I think what we're trying to do is when we were making the decision about our website is, you know, you work with a budget and we're trying to make sure what is the function of this website? What do we need it to do? We need to be make, able to make sure that people within our local area are able to discover us very quickly, get to the point about what our services is, talk about how we have some credibility and authority by showing our Google reviews and, and then being able to have that conversation. So to one thing that we have talked about though is building an about us section because a lot of people like to hear about our story. So that's something we do hope to include in the near future. As you can probably tell though, I like talking about our business very much. I'm a very social person when it comes to going out to events and trying to like get our name out there. Um, so I definitely feel as a company that is being entrusted with the responsibility of handling families' legacies and their media, I think it is important to be able to show a face because they want to know they're not just sending something to a random company and they don't know who is having any interactions with it. Right. So that's even though maybe our, our website doesn't have an about us section uh, as of right now, that's something, again, we're hoping to include here in the near future uh, and with budget and finance permitted. Um, but that's also why I put double the effort in of trying to um, have these conversations, do podcasts, try to do posts, and go into these network events so people see who we are, they see that we're genuine and that we do care. Yeah, I think I think if you have a, even a video of yourself kind of giving a little short intro, like, okay, this is me, the, the, you know, the owners, and this, these are the services we offer, or, or here's the story of how we started, like it, it personalizes that company a little bit more and, and gives more credibility. Like you mentioned, like somebody wants, most people want to deal with other people, not just some kind of a blank, like they're not sure who who's behind there right, kind of a thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. When it, 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 I'd like to give the analogy, like if, if you're going to see a doctor, you see the person, you see who's performing a procedure on you. It's not necessarily a robot. If it's a robot, you're like, uh, what's going on here? So yeah, no, that's, that's definitely something that we've, we've considered and that we want to start doing. I think the great thing about business, it, it's a pro con is that I tend to be the kind of person, obviously with education and advisement to try to take action, uh, sooner than later. A lot of people want to plan, 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 but they don't really have, they don't really start. So I tend to be the one of, well, let's get to a certain milestone. Great. Let's go and try to achieve the next milestone and build from there. And people can see that progress. So uh, definitely we'll be having some more information about our story and what we do in the near future. But again, this is where I, I love, you know, platforms like this where, you know, being able to speak to you and sharing who we are is great. So again, thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, what else would you want to share about your business or about your life? Uh, just kind of open-ended anything you want to share yeah i mean again i would say um i guess for the quick plugs about our business and then i'll, I'll leave it to more of the entrepreneurs at the end uh for those who are considering trying to have like a meaningful gift for their parents obviously our service helps great for them but i would also say that if you want to know more about your heritage maybe today it doesn't seem important but a later time it will 
right? So being able to invest in your family legacy by utilizing services like Timeless Tapes can really help you in that regard and also gives a great way for you to be able to bond with some of your loved ones, whether it's your parents or your grandparents or other relatives that maybe live far away by sending those types of photos and videos can really help kind of establish those relationships. So that's that's the plug on us, I'll say there. Um, but I guess the next thing I will say is for, for entrepreneurs is if you have a drive to want to start a business, don't don't push that feeling down. Explore what that is. Do it and be mindful and be cautious. If you have the opportunities for a mentor or an education or a boot camp, certainly do it. Um, again, books I cannot highly recommend enough. The Right It has been so great, especially for that beginning phase of just making sure is what I am trying to offer to the market something that is viable or not. Um, I think there's another book called uh, One Million Leads. Um, that's another really good one as well. Um, that's again just a great place to get started there. And you know, if you have a dream, go for it. You know, it, you might need to set some guardrails to make sure financially everything in your life is okay. But you'll feel better knowing that you tried rather than you did it. Definitely. Yeah, some good advice. Great advice there. Um, what do you feel that the world needs more of today? Ooh. I, I would say, and, and I don't want to go political, but I'm just going to say I think more patience uh, and tolerance when communicating with one another. You know, I, I feel one of the benefits I have is I've spoken – to people with different types of ide ideologies, but I'm always able to have a conversation and we never leave it feeling like there's tension in the end. And part of me is like, I don't feel like it's good to leave that tension there. Like, how do we address and how do we know that we can come back to one another and speak to each other, whether it's as neighbors or family members, whatever the case may be. So being able to have that tolerance and patience, truly listen, trying to understand what that person is saying, um, don't don't necessarily bend your values, but just give yourself the willingness to understand what other people's values are first, and then you may be able to find a middle ground and compromise in certain things. Um, and again, I again think entrepreneurs. I think they're saying now that this is like one of the uh, like there's more companies that are getting started today more than ever, which is just exciting news to hear. If that's the case, uh, that means just more people trying to achieve their dreams. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, Patrick. So um, uh, maybe one more time, let let everybody, let the audience know how they can reach out to you or uh, reach out for your services. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, we are Timeless Tapes. My name is Patrick Estefanidis. If you can pronounce the last name or if you can't, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, but if you want to reach out about us, get some more information, uh, you can visit our website. It's going to be timeless-tapes.com. You can also send us an email at uh, info at timeless-tapes.com as well. Yeah, Patrick, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your life and a little bit about your business. Yeah, thank you, G. I really appreciate it. This was fun. This was great. Definitely, definitely. All right, until next time.